independent India fought its second war in October and November of 1962. This was with its neighbor to the east, China. India being a smaller military force at the time compared to China, combined with policy and strategic paralysis from the political brass, led to India's defeat against China. The Indian troops at the front, despite being outnumbered one to three, poorly equipped and reinforced, along with poor decisions made by the top brass, fought bravely against the given odds. This video attempts to give an overview of the 1962 India-China war and highlight the challenges and odds faced by the Indian soldiers trying to defend the boundary lines. Problems started brewing up between the Indian and Chinese governments in the 50s with the Chinese claiming boundary disputes in the eastern as well as in the northern parts of India. Multiple rounds of negotiations took place between the governments of the two sides. Unfortunately, these talks led to no resolution. The distrust kept on brewing between the two sides and the situation came to a head in the fall of 1962. With the situation with China worsening, the political establishment under Prime Minister Nehru and Defence Minister V. K. Menon came up with a security policy to combat China. This was the forward policy. Forward policy was an aggressive posturing made by the Indian government where the Indian soldiers were directed to move closer to the line of control with China in dispersed platoon-sized pockets of 10 to 40 troops. The intent was to send a clear signal to the Chinese about India's seriousness on its border positions. The military brass in India was strongly opposed to such a policy without setting up a proper defensive line for the troops. There are five principles for a strong defensive line in a war. Having defensive positions set up in a dominating ground, adequate integral firepower for the troops, mutual cross cover between adjoining defensive positions, locations covered by artillery support from the rear, and robust logistical network. The Indian military situation for these principles in the region was as follows. Dominating grounds. The army did find dominating positions to set up their defenses in accordance with the forward policy. Adequate integral firepower, light machine guns, LMGs were the highest guns with the troops along with some mortars available to them. This was nowhere close to counter the artillery and the MMG assault expected from the Chinese side. Mutual cross cover between adjoining positions. The posts of 10 to 40 troops were 3 to 10 kilometers apart, so there was absolutely no chance for any mutual cross cover between these posts. Artillery support? There was little to no artillery support to most of the positions. Robust logistical network. No logistical network was available in terms of roads or rails to the troops. The Indian side was completely dependent on the Indian Air Force for reinforcements. The 50s was a decade of stagnation for the Indian Armed Forces under Defence Minister Menon, who had immense distrust of the military. His insecurities became bigger with the appointment of General Thamaya, one of India's most decorated army generals as the chief of army staff. The political leadership was looking to appoint someone of their choice to the position of the chief, someone who would not rock the boat. A bitter feud took place between General Thimaya and Defence Minister Menon, leading to the General's resignation and eventual retirement. Nehru and Menon later appointed Lieutenant General B. M. Call as the next Chief of Army Staff, superseding other officers. Lieutenant General B. M. Call was said to be personally very close to Prime Minister Nehru. General Call went ahead with the implementation of the forward policy on the Chinese border. The army commanders in the eastern and the northern sectors objected to the deployment decisions under the forward policy but were overruled by General Call. The forward policy deployments in the northern side were done in the Dalat Beg Oldi complex, Chipchap Valley, Galwan Valley 
and the Sirjap complex in the north bank of Pangangso Lake in the Chushul sector. 36 such formations were guarding a stretch of 480 kilometers from Dolatbeg Oldi to Demchok. On the eastern side, similar deployments were done in Namkachu Valley and Valong. The eastern side had 34 such formations. The Chinese People Liberation Army, PLA, maintained a 3 to 1 numerical advantage over the Indian Army on both the fronts. Add to that, they had artillery support present for all their divisions. With well dug in positions, these odds still could have been managed by the Indian side, but with the implementation of the forward policy, the dispersed defensive locations of the Indian troops meant that the Indian defenses could be easily overrun by the Chinese. By October 1962, there were reports that the PLA had built up close to two divisions opposite the Tawang sector in the east. Even though the Chinese had 3 to 1 numerical superiority with the overall Indian troops, the smaller platoons guarding the forward posts bore the brunt of the complete Chinese assault during the initial phase of the attacks. Namkachu was guarded by four battalions. It was these four battalions that went against the initial assault of two divisions of the Chinese forces. To put things in perspective, one battalion has around 900 troops and one division has 20,000. So during the Battle of Namkachu, around 4,000 Indian troops were up against 40,000 Chinese troops. Considering these odds, it would have been prudent for the four battalions of the Indian forward positions to be pulled back from Namkachu to Tabang. But no decisions were taken at the highest levels in the Indian Army. There was complete decision paralysis at the highest levels of the military brass. Just before the conflict, Lieutenant General Call replaced Lieutenant General Umrao, the commander of the operations in that region, and made himself as the commander. This was done on October 5th, 1962, just two weeks before the Chinese assault came in. Within seven days of him being there, Lieutenant General Call had to be evacuated back to Delhi after suffering high altitude sickness. With the situation worsening in the region, General Call was then replaced by the battle-hardened veteran from the 1947 war, Lieutenant General Harbaksh Singh. This was done on October 17, just three days before the invasion. Unfortunately, by this time, it was too late to change anything at the ground level. The Chinese attack came in the early morning of October 20th, 1962, on the southern banks of the Namkachu River. The Indian side expected the Chinese to come from one of the five bridges on that route, and hence were guarding those bridges in their defensive positions. But the river was shallow at the time, so the Chinese troops crept through in the early morning hours of the 20th to occupy positions behind the Indian defensive lines. 5 a.m. on October 20th, 1962, the Chinese began strong artillery fire using 82mm and 120mm mortars at the Indian troops. And at 6.30 a.m., the Chinese infantry launched a surprise attack at the Indian positions from behind completely surprising the Indian troops. Two of the four battalions defending Namkachu, the Rajputs and the Gurkhas faced the initial assault. They fought back against the assault with whatever they had. Unfortunately, that was not enough to push back the Chinese assault and both battalions were decimated within hours of the attack. Out of 513 troops deployed at Namkachu from the Rajputs, 282 lost their lives and 171 were taken as prisoners of war. Only 60 troops out of 513 survived this assault. On the Gurkha side, 493 troops were taken as prisoners of war, including the commanding officer. The two other battalions, four Grenadiers and nine Punjab, also suffered heavy casualties but were able to move southwards to reinforce the Wang. The Chinese were able to outflank their retreat and they were forced to head towards Bhutan, pushing them out of the battle. Two of the four battalions defending Namkachu, the Rajputs and the Gurkhas faced the initial assault. They fought back against the assault with whatever they had. 
Unfortunately, that was not enough to push back the Chinese assault and both battalions were decimated within hours of the attack. Out of 513 troops deployed at Damkachu from the Rajputs, 282 lost their lives and 171 were taken as prisoners of war. Only 60 troops out of 513 survived this assault. On the Gurkha side, 493 troops were taken as prisoners of war, including their commanding officer. The two other battalions, 4 Grenadiers and 9 Punjab, also suffered heavy casualties but were able to move southwards to reinforce the Wang. The Chinese were able to outflank their retreat and they were forced to head towards Bhutan, pushing them out of the battle. Within 12 hours of the assault, the PLA had crashed through India's forward defenses and were poised to capture Tawang. The Chinese assault at the Bumla Pass faced stiff resistance from one platoon of one Sikh commanded by Subedar Joginder Singh. When their platoon came under attack from an entire Chinese brigade, one Sikh, along with some artillery support, held off the enemy for eight hours and inflicted around 300 casualties on the enemy. They subsequently had to retreat from their positions. Subedar Joginder Singh was awarded with the Paramvir Chakra for leading his small platoon against the Chinese assault. With the Chinese troops coming in such high numbers, the defense of Tawang now was untenable. The Indian side prepared to set up their defense at Sila and Tawang was vacated on October 23, 1962. The enemy launched another thrust in the Walong sector on October 22, 1962. Guarding that sector was one platoon of Assam rifles, which had been recently reinforced with six Kumau and four Sikh in early October. The initial Chinese assault was successfully pushed back by the Indian forces. Six Kumau and four Sikh were well dug in and took a heavy toll on the advancing Chinese troops. The Chinese then came in with reinforcements and attacked in much greater strength. The defense forces had to eventually withdraw from their positions under intense MMG and mortar assaults from the Chinese. On the northern side, the Chinese PLA had gradually built a significant superiority in both infantry and artillery resources. The initial areas of interest for the Chinese were the Dalat Beg Oldi airfields, the Galwan Valley, the Spangor Gap between Pangong So and Spangor Lake that leads to the Chushul complex. Their objectives were to make inroads into the Dalat Beg Oldi complex and make way into the Chushul Valley. Five Jat Regiment was spread out 320 kilometers from Dalat Beg Oldi in the north to the Chushul Valley in the south. The first Chinese assault came in at Galwan Valley on a small pocket of troops from Five Jat defending it. The troops got wiped out by a force five times bigger than them. At Dalat Beg Oldi, a company of Five Jat troops defended their positions and held the Chinese advance by a rearguard action across the Shiok River for a total of 18 days before they had to be evacuated by air to safety. With this, most forward positions in the north as well as the east had been wiped out by the initial Chinese assault. The complete collapse at Namkachu and Tawang in the east and the disintegration of all forward positions at Ladakh sent the Indian political leadership into a state of shock. V.K. Menon was relieved of his charge of Ministry of Defence and the Army Headquarters took complete charge of all military operations from here on. After the first assault, there was a lull in the battle with the Chinese planning for the second phase of assault. The Indian side took this opportunity to send reinforcements to the garrisons at Sila and Bomdila, with the command headquarters located at Tezpur. Tezpur was a strategically important town for the Indian side. The Chinese, meanwhile, also built up their forces up to three divisions in the region. With their numerical superiority, they saw the opportunity to outflank the Indian defenses at Sila by engaging two of their divisions on that town, while the third division bypasses Sila straight to go for the juggler by attacking Bomdila. By attacking Bomdila, they could threaten Tezpur at the earliest. The attack went in on November 17, 1962, and as expected, 
the Indian side at Sila bravely fought the tactical battle against the enemy, pushing back multiple waves of attacks. The Indian Divisional Command saw the possibility of the defences at Sila being bypassed by the 3rd Division of the PLA, so they ordered the troops at Sila to move back to Bomdila. This was the only option they had, otherwise they carried the risk of being surrounded at Sila. The troops at Sila suffered very heavy losses during their retreat, including their brigade commander, Brigadier Hoshiar Singh, who lost his life during the retreat. After the losses to the troops at Sila and the previous losses at Tamkachu, the morale of the Indian troops guarding Bomdila was extremely low. They offered very little resistance at Bomdila as one division of PLA advanced towards them on November 19, 1962. The Chinese now had captured Bomdila and were a mere 120 kilometers away from the strategically important town of Tezpur. In the Valong sector, the resistance from the Indian side was more spirited and stubborn against the overwhelming strength of a whole division on that front. Along with four Sikh and six Kumau, a Gurkha and Dogra battalion were also added for the sector's defense. The battalions at Valong sector fought bravely and did significant attrition to the enemy, but under overwhelming odds, they too were pushed back from their positions. In the dark, the primary objective of the PLA was to capture the areas in the Chushul sector because this sector offered the biggest potential for the Chinese to be able to threaten Leh. India recognized this threat and reinforced Chushul in early November and rushed in two other brigades to defend Leh and Chushul. So Leh was protected from the east and the southeast. 4.30 am November 18th, 1962 the decisive battle for Chushul began between the Indian and the Chinese side. The Gurkhas were guarding two places in this sector, north of the Pangang So Lake, Sirijap complex, and in the Spangur Gap in the two locations, one prominent hill feature called Gurung Hill. A company of troops led by company commander of Gurkha rifles, Major Dhan Singh Thapa, displayed heroic resistance against a strong enemy assault. The entire company was either killed or taken prisoners. The other two companies fought excellent against a numerically superior enemy and with the help of very good artillery support, they too withdrew towards Chushul and suffered heavy losses during that withdrawal. The presence of strong artillery and tanks at Chushul changed the equation for the Chinese because now any attacks at Chushul would turn into a battle of attrition and may lead to very heavy losses for them. Having occupied all crucial features around the Chushul airfield, the Chinese declared unilateral ceasefire on November 20th, 1962. The Indian army in Ladakh defended very well against continuous assaults from a numerically superior enemy. Nothing embodies that better than the epic battle at Rizangla, a hill feature overlooking the initial approaches to Chushul. Rizangla was defended by a company of 124 men of 13 Kumau Regiment under the command of Major Shaitan Singh. These men beat back multiple assaults from the Chinese on this feature and fought till the last man and the last bullet. In the end, out of the total of 124 men at Razangla, only 10 could survive. Major Shaitan Singh kept on fighting despite being badly injured until he was mowed down by a machine gun fire. For his leadership, bravery and courage during this battle, he was posthumously awarded the Paramvir Chakra. Eight others in the company were awarded the Veer Chakra. A unilateral ceasefire was declared by China on November 20th, 1962, and the Chinese side announced its withdrawal to its claimed line of actual control. The objective of the Chinese to assert itself as the unquestioned regional power had been achieved. The aftermath of the defeat against China saw sweeping changes in the Indian military to prepare for such conflicts in the future. The results of these changes were seen in the subsequent conflicts of 1965 and 1971 against Pakistan and 1967 against China.